Chapter 17 Bird of Prey Look out! Amanda cried. The warning fell from her lips just as the mutant hit the ground. He landed no more than ten yards away from the truck. Dal stood next to the vehicle, the transmitter in his arms. He had only enough time to shove the transmitter back through the open door of the truck before the mutant hit him. The monster slammed them both into the side of the truck. They ricocheted off the side and hit the ground, rolling down the hillside. Dal! Lena screamed. Dal's gun still lay in the front seat of the truck. All he had for defense was his bare hands and his hunting knife. Amanda jumped out of the truck, tearing down the hillside after Dal. She wasn't sure what she planned to do. There was no way for her to shoot without risking Dal. All she knew was that Dal could die if she did nothing. Both arms of the mutant had grown long from the Nejit virus mutation. The muscles were massive, looking as though they belonged on a man three times the size of the backpacker. No wonder he'd been able to move through the trees like a monkey. He practically had the upper body strength of a superhero. Amanda felt another spike of panic shoot through her as Dal and the mutant continued to roll over one another. They gained momentum on the hillside, moving too fast for her to keep up. Determination surged through Amanda. She had gotten an A on her timed mile. She might not be an all-state track star, but she wasn't slow. And she was running downhill. Every science nerd knew gravity pulled things downhill. She gave herself over to the natural pull of the earth, running as fast as she could after Dal and the mutant. Behind her, Lena kept screaming Dal's name. Dal and the mutant rolled to a stop in a shallow patch of earth, momentarily separated from one another. They got to their feet and rushed each other at the same time, smacking into one another. They hit so hard, they both went back down. They continued rolling downhill toward the tree line. They fought each other like rabid gorillas, scratching and swinging at one another. Amanda kicked on another burst of speed, thanking Jane Fonda for all those killer workouts. She nailed that nine-minute mile in P.E. She could do this. The cool morning air rushed past her as she pumped her arms, running as fast as she could. The machine gun bounced against her stomach as she ran. Dal and the mutant crashed into a tall redwood on the edge of the tree line. Dal had his hands around the mutant's neck. Amanda wasn't sure if he was trying to choke the monster to death or if it was the only way to keep the mutant's bared rictus away from him. The mutant had his hands wrapped around Dal's head. Thanks to the mutation of the Nejit virus, he had superior reach and strength in his arms. Amanda knew one thing. The last place Dal's head should be was within mutant hands. If they didn't act fast the mutant would crack open his skull like an egg. Amanda charged straight into the melee. The mutant was on top. She shoved as hard as she could, throwing all her weight against the monster. To her shock, the mutant flew to the side, landing hard against a boulder that peeked up from the ground. He hit so hard, Amanda heard the dull contact of his bones against the stone. His head whipped back, connecting with the stone. The mutant lay where he was, momentarily stunned. It was the opening Dal needed. He bounded to his feet, knife flashing. The blade buried all the way up to the hilt in the mutant's eyeball. He shuddered once before going still. Amanda grabbed her gun and backed away from the tree line, anticipating yet more mutants. It was stupid to assume there was only one out here. Zombies often traveled in packs. Lena caught up to them, breathing hard from the run. Her eyes were wild as she alternated between scanning the trees and assessing Dal. Her gun was aimed at the forest. Dal yanked the knife free. Dark, sticky blood dripped down the blade and stained his hand. He dropped into a crouch, 
looking ready to spring at the first sign of danger. The three of them stood in a tight line. Nothing moved. The trees rustled softly in the breeze. Birds chirped. Back away from the trees, Dal said softly. Not taking her eye from the brush, Amanda backed slowly up the hill with Dal and Lena. She kept her gun up the entire time, as did Lena. The three of them didn't stop until they reached the truck. Think that was the only one? Amanda whispered. We're in the middle of nowhere, Dal said. Maybe that guy was backpacking by himself? It was plausible. Armstrong Woods was a popular place among backpackers. The three of them stood in a line next to the truck for another few minutes. When nothing else emerged from the woods, Dal turned to Amanda. You saved my ass back there. Thanks. She both loved the praise and was embarrassed by it. I just pushed him off you. Lena would have done the same if she'd reached you first. No way, Lena shook her head. You threw that guy at least six feet when you shoved him. I couldn't have done that. You're strong, Amanda. Fast, too. I couldn't catch up with you. In football terms, you'd be a defensive lineman. Dal studied her with a critical eye. Did you play any sports in high school? No, just chess. A memory surfaced. Gym class. Sophomore year. Mrs. Fink made the girls do a timed ropes course. This was before Amanda started working out with Jane Fonda. Even back then, she'd managed to get the third fastest time. She'd been vaguely aware that she was freakishly strong. This realization had been buried under the embarrassment of knowing every girl in class watched her climb the rope. I didn't know girls like you could move so fast, Mrs. Fink had said when she finished. Girls like you. Fat girls. That's what Mrs. Fink, with her perfect triathlete figure, had really been saying. Fat girls shouldn't be fast at a ropes course. Amanda focused on the part of the memory that mattered. I guess I've always had pretty good upper body strength. And then, overcoming a burst of shyness, she added, I had the third fastest time on the ropes course my sophomore year. Fast and strong, Dal said. Maybe we can have the guys teach you some moves when they get back from Luma, Lena said. They could come in handy like they did today. Thanks for saving Dal, by the way. Amanda tried to hide how much those words meant to her. No one had ever, ever complimented her for an athletic feat. At a loss for words, she said, I wish I had one of you for a P.E. teacher. I wouldn't have sweated my grade so much. Mrs. Fink was a jerk, Lena rolled her eyes. If I had to hear one more story about her stupid triathlon workouts... I thought my head would explode. She gave everyone a hard time if they weren't a sports star. She turned to Dal. Come on, let's get this over with so we can get back to the cabin. I don't want to stick around and wait for any more backpacking mutants to attack us. Speaking of mutants, Amanda cleared her throat, flushing when Dal and Lena both looked at her. <laughs> I, uh... She was suddenly too self-conscious to tell them what she wanted to do. Is it okay if I, uh, go out and check the dead mutant? Dal and Lena stared at her as if she'd lost her mind. What for? Dal asked. I just want to get a closer look at it. I, uh, thought maybe we could learn something useful. I mean, it's not like we're ever going to get a chance to study them. We're always too busy fighting or running for our lives. The way their limbs and muscles distend is interesting. God, she sounded like a crazy girl with a fetish for dead bodies. I'm just saying we know next to nothing about the mutants. Maybe we can learn something. 
they were both frowning at her. Amanda wanted to disappear into the ground. Never mind, she said, a bit breathless. No, it's a good idea, Lena said. We just never thought of it. I'm a bit of a biology geek, Amanda laughed to cover up her discomfort. Dal, I don't think she should go back down there alone. Can you manage up here if I go with her? Lena asked. Yeah, Dal nodded. Just don't take too long. I want to get out of here as soon as the broadcast is complete. Chapter 18 Sample Amanda crouched down and lifted one of the distended arms of the dead mutant backpacker. Gosh, the arm sure was heavy. She prodded at the muscles with her forefinger. Dense, she muttered to herself. What? Lena asked. His muscles are really dense. Feel them. She stepped to one side so Lena could get in closer. Lena looked at her as though she'd lost her mind. I'm not touching that thing. I can't believe you're handling it with your bare hands. Oh, Amanda shrugged. This is nothing. You should have seen me in biology during the dissections. I was sort of a hog. Luckily, Cassie was my lab partner. She didn't mind letting me do all the cutting and stuff. Thinking of Cassie made her feel anxious. She wished she knew where her best friend was and if she was okay. She wished they had futuristic walkie-talkies so they could keep in touch over long ranges, like those portable phones they had in sci-fi movies. Uh, Lena? Yeah? I wasn't being totally honest when I said I wanted to take a look at the mutant. What do you mean? Amanda drew in a breath. There was no way to sugarcoat this. Neither was there a way to covertly steal a tissue sample. I want to get a tissue sample from the mutant. Lena's eyes nearly popped out of her head. You want to what? I want a tissue sample. Um, okay. What are you going to do with it? Figure out a way to study it. The Soviets manufactured the Nejet virus in a lab. They developed a vaccine for it. This is a full-scale bio-war, and America is behind the eight ball. It's worth getting a closer look at a tissue sample. Who knows what we might learn that might be useful? Yeah, but how are you going to study it? It's not like we have a science lab back at the cabin. Amanda swallowed her nervousness. In for a penny, in for a pound, she supposed. She launched into the same plan she laid out for Stevenson the night before. Lena listened to it all. Unlike Stevenson, she didn't interrupt, until Amanda got to the part about stashing the tissue sample in the freezer. I don't think it's a terrible idea, but I'm not sure Nona will ever agree to letting you put zombie flesh in the freezer. You don't think it's a dumb idea? It couldn't hurt. I'm not sure when we'll make it back into Bastopol for a microscope, but we can ask Leo when he gets back. Amanda brightened. Stevenson might think she was crazy, but Lena didn't. I'll get the sample. She paused as she pulled out her knife. You might not want to watch this. Lena turned to the side, scanning the area and keeping her gun up. Amanda placed the knife against the side of the dead mutant's arm and sliced. The muscles were so thick and dense it was difficult to get the knife through, and her chikino blade was sharp. Jeez! Amanda shifted her stance, trying to get better leverage. She was forced to saw her blade back and forth. What? The muscle mass is really dense. She paused in her sawing. I wonder if the Nejet virus started as a way to make a super soldier. What do you mean? 
Despite herself, Lena turned to study the mutant. The mutants are an unexpected side effect of the Nejit virus, which means some part of this virus is designed to increase muscle size and density. Why would you design a virus to do that if you weren't planning to use the recipient in a fight? This was getting more interesting by the second. Say you're right. What does it mean? Lena asked. I don't know yet, but it's more information than we had sixty seconds ago. Amanda finally managed to get the knife all the way through. A chunk of muscle thunked to the ground. You're seriously not grossed out by what you're doing? No, blood has never bothered me. Amanda furrowed her brow as she once again squeezed the dense muscle of the corpse. Do you think these guys can swim? Their body density must be off the charts. I wonder if they'd sink. We can test out your theory if we're ever running from mutants and happen to be near water. Is that all you need? Lena gestured to the dead mutant. Amanda considered the body. Honestly, it would probably be a good idea to get an organ for study. But even though she wasn't bothered by blood, there was a big difference between slicing off a piece of arm muscle and digging around in a body cavity. She definitely wanted gloves for that. Yeah, I think that will do for now. She fished the Ziploc out of her pocket and used it to pick up the chunk of flesh. After compressing the seal, she wrapped the plastic up and tucked the whole piece into her back pocket. Is there a reason you wanted to get the flesh sampled today? Lena had turned her attention to the trees. It's not like I can go out any time I want to get a piece of mutants. I figured if we ran into any out here, we may actually have a chance to get a piece of him. She glanced at the body. Literally, a piece of him. The girls climbed back up the hillside to the truck. Dal had taken down the antenna and was sliding the transmitter back through the cab window. Everything goes smoothly with the broadcast? Yep. How'd it go for you guys? We learned mutants have very dense muscle mass, Lena said. Amanda thinks the Najit virus was originally intended to create super soldiers. Dal's eyebrows rose. Really? Just a theory. Amanda climbed into the back of the truck. All information is good, though, right? Sure. Can't hurt, Dal said. Lena shot Amanda a conspiratorial grin. Now we just need to get you a microscope. Dal fired up the engine, made a slow three-point turn, and headed back the way they had come. They entered a thickly wooded section, the tall trees on either side of them casting the truck into shade. Dal was forced to weave among the trees. Amanda fished the tissue sample out of her pocket. She pressed the flesh between her fingers, once again marveling at how solid it was. It felt firm, almost like a cork from one of her parents' wine bottles. She would love to know how it compared to a piece of muscle off a regular human, but they didn't dissect humans in high school. Amanda had been considering a degree in pre-med for her college undergrad. As she turned the Ziploc-wrapped sample between her hands, she realized how well-suited she would be for the field. It wasn't until she returned the sample to her pocket that she looked up and noticed the helicopter in the sky. The old truck was so loud, she hadn't even heard the approaching chopper over the roar of the engine. Panic leaped into her throat. Guys, helicopter! What the hell? Lena spun around, kneeling on the front seat for a better look. Dal craned his neck, attempting to adjust the rearview mirror while he drove. Holy shit, Lena said. Dal, we have to get out of sight. Chapter 19 Log 
Dal jerked the steering wheel, heading into a thicker clump of trees. Amanda couldn't peel her eyes from the incoming helicopter. It was white with a big red cross painted on the side. It was a medical helicopter flying over Armstrong Woods and heading straight for them. It must be filled with Soviets. As much as Amanda wanted to believe something else, it was the only reasonable explanation. There hadn't been anything in the sky since the invasion. They found us, Amanda said. Lena must have come to the same conclusion. Dal, how long was your broadcast? I cut it off at 45 seconds. The truck bumped over the rocky terrain as Dal frantically edged it through the trees. Not a second over. You know how careful I am. They were ready for us. Amanda tracked the helicopter. It gained on them with every passing second. They must have assigned a team to monitor the airwaves and track us. This was bad. Very, very bad. Dell continued to edge the truck between the trunks. They came up against a wall of bay trees and were forced to stop. The trees were too close together. There was no way to get the truck to the other side without backtracking. They couldn't afford to backtrack. They were out of time. The womp-womp of the helicopter blades were nearly upon them. Out! Dal cried. We have to hide. Amanda seized her gun, jumped out of the truck, and landed beside Lena. They hustled around the front of the truck and sprinted as fast as they could to get away from the truck. The helicopter flew into view. Amanda felt the wind of its blades against the back of her neck. Mrs. Fink wouldn't recognize her if she saw her now. Get down, Lena screamed. The girls went in opposite directions. Lena leaped for shelter in a tight cluster of madrones. Amanda dove for cover behind a fallen bay tree, hugging her machine gun to her chest. The tree had tipped over recently. The leaves were still green and pungent. Amanda had just enough time to throw her arms over her head before an explosion detonated behind her. She smothered a scream as shrapnel cut through the air. Chunks of metal from the truck. Glass. She even saw the remains of the transmitter ejected through the air. The very air vibrated from the strike. The dust hadn't even settled before another explosion hit the truck. This time, dust and forest debris accompanied the shrapnel. Amanda inhaled a lungful of dust and coughed. The helicopter whirred overhead. She braced herself for another explosion. It came, except it wasn't the truck that was under attack this time. She peered through the trees just in time to see the helicopter drift ten yards to the right heading straight toward the cluster of trees where Lena had taken cover. A grenade fell through the sky. Lena! Dal's howl could probably be heard all the way back in Rossi. Grenades rained down. The Soviets circled the area where they hid, dropping them out of the sky. Amanda did the only thing she could think to do. She ran. She didn't know where Dal and Lena were in the confusion, but she couldn't help if she stuck around and waited for a grenade to fall on her head. The loose earth slipped under her feet as she darted away from the attack. She nearly face-planted into a tree. Catching herself on lichen-covered trunk, she pushed free and burst forward in a headlong sprint. She dodged under low-hanging branches, around thick clusters of manzanita, and plunged straight through thickets of ferns. When a shallow creek yawned before her, she didn't hesitate. Her feet hit the water as she splashed through. The explosions chased her. The air vibrated with every strike, sending a spear of fear through her each time. A fallen tree loomed before her, the top half of the crown lodged in a neighboring tree. It was too tall for her to jump over. Going around would take too long. Amanda dropped to the ground and rolled, crunching on rocks and leaves and sticks as she popped down on the other side. A twig became lodged in her hair and scratched at her cheek. She barely noticed. 
she kept running. The shock wave of each grenade was like the bay of a hellhound. After some time, she realized the only sound was that of her own ragged breathing. The bombing had stopped. The helicopter was still out there, but it was moving away from them. The whomp, whomp of the blades grew distant. She halted in a small clearing. Her chest heaved. Sweat dripped down her temples, chest, and back. Every nerve stood on end as she listened to the retreating chopper. Except it wasn't retreating, not entirely. Peering up through the branches, she caught sight of the chopper lowering itself to the ground. It was at least two miles away, but that was a hell of a lot closer than she would have liked. Honestly, Italy would have been too close as far as she was concerned. The Soviets were coming for them. They wanted to find their bodies and make sure they were all dead. Through the pounding of the blood in her ears, she heard a voice. Fear spiked through her, but she forced herself to stay where she was. The voice shouted a second time. It wasn't Russians like she'd feared. No, she knew that voice. Amanda, where are you? It was Dal. He was somewhere behind her, calling her name. Dal? Dal, where are you guys? Is Lena with you? She hurried through the forest, following the sound of Dal's voice. Apprehension pricked her scalp as she strained to follow the sound of the descending helicopter. All she wanted to do was cover her head and hide under a bush. Suck it up, she scolded herself. Your friends need you. The forest was a wasteland. The Soviets had bombed the shit out of it. Debris from Mr. Chikino's brown pickup was everywhere. Entire trees had been blown up. Huge cavities yawned open in the earth, big pits of scorched dirt and singed forest debris. A war zone. She was moving through a literal war zone. She knew they were in the middle of a war, of course. She'd heard stories from Jennifer and the others of just how bad it was. But this was Amanda's first time in a combat zone. In just a few short minutes, this beautiful patch of forest had been reduced to smoldering trunks and scorched earth. She didn't like the idea of making noise, but there was no other way to find her friends. Besides, the helicopter had just landed. The Soviets were at least two miles away. She cupped her hands around her mouth. Dal, where are you guys? Amanda, over here, quick. There, just off to her left. She pushed through a tangle of fallen branches, squeezing herself between logs. Using her hands to shield her face as she pushed through the debris, she finally found her friends. Dal stood over a tree trunk. Dirt and blood smeared his face. Tear tracks cut through grime. His face was set, something dangerous and frenetic lurking behind his eyes. The Russians are coming, Amanda said breathlessly. We have to get out of here. She froze. Beneath a fallen trunk was Lena. A tree almost a foot in diameter had been felled during the attack, trapping Lena beneath it. Amanda's lungs stopped working. Lena wasn't moving. Her eyes were closed, her body slack. Blood ran down her face from a gash in her forehead. She'd been hit pretty hard in the head. She stared at the other girl, searching. Searching. There. Amanda's shoulders sagged with relief as Lena's chest rose in a shallow inhale. She was still alive. I can't get this fucking thing off of her. Dal shocked the hell out of Amanda by delivering a brutal punch to the side of the fallen tree. He hit it so hard, the skin across his knuckles cracked open and began to bleed. He followed this up with a kick that shook the smaller branches of the tree. The easygoing, sweet Dal she was used to had transformed before her eyes. She'd never seen this side of him before. To be honest, 
it freaked her out. A lot. Then again, his girlfriend was unconscious and pinned beneath a tree. Amanda was close to losing her shit, and she wasn't even remotely as close to Lena as Dal was. For both their sakes, she tried to remain calm. We have to get the trunk off her. He rounded on her and screamed. What the fuck do you think I've been trying to do? We have to get her out of here before the Russians find us. Amanda froze, not daring to move as Dal seethed in front of her. His chest heaved. She swallowed, never taking her eyes off him. She'd heard stories about his crazy dad. Maybe Dal had inherited his temper. She forced herself to keep her voice level. I'm going to try and lift. Help me? She watched him visibly wrangle his temper. Amanda had once gone to a bull riding contest at the county fair with Cassie and Stevenson. In her opinion, no one with any amount of common sense would enter an enclosed space with an enraged animal. It would be less scary sticking your finger in a live light socket. But Stevenson had wanted to go. He'd had a whole speech about wanting to see masculine intelligence at its finest. Amanda thought it was weird, but she went for her friend's sake. It had been as awful to watch as she'd imagined. Full-grown men purposefully got onto the back of a crazed animal for the singular purpose of trying to stay on its back. Which was impossible, of course. The bull always won. Watching Dow wasn't so different from watching those idiots on the bucking bulls. Except Dow wasn't an idiot, and his temper was ten times scarier than those bulls. His fists clenched and unclenched. He drew in several deep breaths, trying to stop the heaving of his chest. A shiver ran through his body as he fought back whatever demon lived inside of him. If she hadn't been so wary of him, Amanda's heart might have broken when she watched him scrub at his eyes with the back of his hand. When his hand fell away, the Dal she knew was back. Almost. There was still an edge in his eyes that intimidated the hell out of her, but at least he didn't look so scary anymore. He came to stand by Amanda, bracing himself by the tree trunk. Amanda wrapped both her hands around the trunk, bending her knees to give herself leverage. On the count of three. At Dal's nod, she counted. One, two, three. Amanda gripped the tree with everything she had. She pressed up with her leg. She pulled with her arms. She strained with her back. The tree moved. Inch by painful inch, she and Dal pried the tree up from Lena's still form. Get her, Amanda wheezed, refusing to let go of the tree. I'll hold it. Dal didn't have to be asked twice. He released his part of the tree, diving to the forest floor to grab Lena by the shoulders. Amanda gasped as the added weight strained her muscles. Sweat popped out along her brow. Her arms screamed. Her back protested. Her legs wanted to collapse. She held on. Hurry, she gasped. I don't know how much longer I can hold it. Dal had both hands under Lena's armpits. He scurried backward, dragging her out from under the tree. As soon as Lena was free, Amanda dropped the tree. It thunked back to the ground, limbs and leaves rustling. She sucked in great gulps of air, hardly able to comprehend what she'd just done. For the first time, her eyes took in the enormity of the trees she'd just single-handedly held up from the ground. Massive did not begin to cover it. No way should she have been able to hold it on her own. Dal was a big, strong guy like Leo. Not even he had been able to lift the tree on his own. But she'd done it. She'd held the tree long enough for Dal to get Lena free. Somehow, she'd done it. You're a fucking Amazon. She turned around. 
Dal sat on the ground, Lena cradled in his lap. When he looked up at Amanda, she felt like she was being seen for the first time. You're a fucking Amazon, Dal repeated. You saved her. His chest hitched. Lena would still be under that tree if not for you. For the first time in her life, Amanda looked down at her body with a sense of reverence. Until today, she hadn't really acknowledged or appreciated the strength that lived within her. Amazon. That's what Dal had called her. Hell yes! Amazon. Tasting the word felt like reconnecting with a hidden part of herself. She was an Amazon. So what if she wasn't a petite triathlete like Mrs. Fink? Mrs. Fink couldn't have thrown a mutant zombie off Dal. Mrs. Fink couldn't have picked up that tree off Lena. She bet Mrs. Fink couldn't even nail her own ropes course. Amanda recalled the P.E. teacher showing off on occasion, like when it came to planking or jumping over a hurdle. But she'd never scaled one of her long ropes like she made all the girls do. Maybe Mrs. Fink wasn't as confident as she pretended to be. Amanda knelt beside Dal and Lena, wishing she had some water to clean Lena's face. Something caught her attention in her periphery. Mr. Chikino's truck, or what was left of it anyway. It lay in pieces. The trees around it had been blown up with the grenades. The undercarriage of the truck was nothing more than a twisted metal hunk. The remains of the front seat were lodged ten feet away in the boughs of a fallen tree. It was gone. Their mobile broadcasting station had been blown to smithereens. The sight of it hurt. How would they get messages out to the people? How would they get home? More importantly, how would they get away from the team of Russians bearing down on them? Chapter 20 Boulder Dal rocked Lena in his arms, continuously smoothing hair away from her face. Come on, babe, he murmured. You have to wake up. It hurt to see the anguish in his expression. Even worse was knowing they had no supplies, no water, no food, no first aid kit, and no way home. Dal, we have to get out of here. How fast could the Soviets run through the forest? The very idea of them bearing down on their location filled her with terror. Can you carry her? Dal nodded. He rose, lifting Lena in his arms and holding her close. Amanda hustled through the ruined trees, heading away from the general direction of Mr. Chikino's truck. She held back the bigger branches, doing her best to clear the way for Dal. They had to weave in and out around the wrecked trees. They even came across the steering wheel of Mr. Chikino's truck. Part of it had melted in the explosion. Dal paused, looking down at it. Emotion passed over his features. Grief. Loss. Amanda guessed Mr. Chikino had been like a father to Dal. Losing his truck probably felt like losing one of the few things that remained of him. Dal stepped over the steering wheel and kept going. They hiked another ten minutes. Amanda kept her ears peeled for sounds of the Soviets, but heard nothing. Not good. She'd feel a whole lot better if they were shooting off guns or shouting. The quiet made her feel like they were being hunted. Dal? Amanda whispered. What are we going to do? We walk home. Walk? All the way home? Isn't home like 15 miles away from here? Give or take, yeah. They had no supplies, and Lena was unconscious. 
Amanda decided now was not the time to point out their shortcomings. She wasn't sure Dal could handle any more bad news. That scary edge had dissipated, but she sensed it could return. A soft moan escaped Lena's mouth. Her eyes snapped open, a hand flying to her head. Dal? Oh, thank God. Dal crushed her against his chest, kissing her cheek. You scared the shit out of me. He paused, setting her gently on her feet. Lena swooned, latching on to Dal's elbow. Blinking rapidly to clear her vision, she drew in a few deep breaths. I got hit in the head. She probed at the wound on the side of her forehead. You got pinned under a tree. You'd still be under there if not for Amanda. He shot her a quick smile. Sorry to be a buzzkill, but the Soviets are coming. We have to get out of here. Amanda strained her ears, the silence making her skin itch. Lena, do you think you can walk? Dad's truck? It's gone, baby. Dal brushed the side of her face. Lena's mouth set in a tight line. Then we walk. Are you okay? Dal surveyed her with concern. I can walk. Her eyes hardened. No way am I going to sit around and wait for the Soviets to find us. Dal led the way, one hand firmly holding onto Lena's. Amanda trailed behind them, fighting the panic that threatened to choke her. Do you know how to get back to the cabin? She asked. We just have to head southwest, Dal replied. Amanda took this to mean Dal knew which direction was southwest. Thank God. Amanda never had a great sense of direction. She may have even gotten turned around in a mall parking lot once or twice. They beat their way through the forest, making a ton of noise in the process. There was no helping it. Sticks and leaves crinkled beneath their feet. Twigs and branches snapped in their wake as they were forced to push through shrubs. How the heck did deer and other animals move without making noise? The three of them sounded like elephants crashing through the undergrowth. Their only saving grace was the distance they had on the Russians. They were far enough away that the Russians wouldn't be able to hear them. Hopefully. Think they'll assume we died in the attack on the truck? Amanda asked. I think they're looking for our bodies, Dal said grimly. And when they don't find them? Lena's question hung in the air. No one answered. They didn't have to. It didn't take a genius to figure the snipers were wanted by the Russians. They'd raised hell among the invaders on too many occasions. These broadcasts were likely a particularly large thorn in the Soviets' collective side. We can't get captured, Dal said. We avoid them at all costs. Lena, sorry to ask this of you, but can you move any faster? I'm okay, she replied. To prove it, she picked up her pace. They continued their laborious push through the woods. Amanda's only consolation was that it would be as hard going for the Soviets as it was for them. Down a ravine, up the other side, through dry stream bed that swarmed with clouds of gnats, around the thick trunks of oak trees and through ferns still wet with morning dew, over a log covered with sticky spider webs that stuck to their hands, through a thick stand of manzanita trees. Before the war, Amanda had always rather liked manzanita trees. Their peeling reddish bark was so vibrant and pretty. By the time she elbowed her way through the fourth or fifth cluster of them, she decided the only good manzanita was a felled one that had been converted into firewood. The twig-like limbs were pokey. She was covered with dozens of tiny scrapes. She worked up a sweat as they floundered their way through the forest. To her surprise, she noticed Dal and Lena sweating just as vigorously. As she processed the long sweat stain down the spine of Lena's shirt, it occurred to her that she had no trouble keeping up with the two of them. 
both Dal and Lena were fit, but maybe Amanda was in better shape than she'd given herself credit for. Who would have thought she'd have no problem keeping up with these two? All those months of working out with Jane Fonda had paid off. Heck, she'd probably owed her life to the freakishly peppy aerobic instructor. The temperature was picking up. It was going to be a hot one today. It was late summer, bordering on fall. This time of year in West County could be sweltering. They were going to need water. Which meant drinking out of a stream or creek if they were lucky enough to come across another one. That might be just as bad as dying of dehydration if they drank bad water. Don't think of that, she scolded herself. Instead, she thought about the long miles that stood between them and the Chiquino cabin. Amanda quailed at the idea of bushwhacking 15 miles all the way back to the cabin. They reached a large clearing. Dal and Lena paused, surveying the open grassland between them and the next stretch of woods. Do we risk it? Amanda would trade her pinky finger for that 200 yards of open grassland. Dal and Lena exchanged glances before returning to their study of the clearing. Too risky, Dal said at last. We don't know where the Soviets are. Amanda wanted to point out they could crawl through the grass. It might destroy their knees, but it still would be faster than hiking through the trees. Then she pictured Soviets crouched on the edge of the clearing with their guns, just waiting for them to blunder into the open like amateurs. That was enough of a horror show for her. Definitely better to stick to the woods. The trees were spaced more widely apart in this area. They stuck to the thicker area of the woods, staying under cover. Something rumbled in the distance. The helicopter lifted back into the air. It swooped low over the woods, circling a larger area. A Soviet gunman sat in the open doorway of the chopper, legs dangling over the air. A machine gun was in his hands. They're still looking for us, Amanda hissed. The helicopter had looped north, but it swung back around in their direction. Her eyes landed on the wide clearing they currently skirted around. It would make an ideal landing pad. Um, guys, do you think they might park the helicopter in that clearing? Dal's eyes were pinched with concentration. It's a possibility. We have to keep moving. The womp. Wump of the helicopter blades gained in strength. Minutes later, it flew into view right over the clearing. But it didn't land. Instead, it flew in wide circles overhead. No doubt about it, they were scanning the area. Amanda wished she had on camouflage gear, like the kind deer and pig hunters wore in town every once in a while. That would be a top priority when she got back to the cabin. Maybe she and Stevenson would go on a mission to the hunting shop in Westville so she could get a proper outdoor outfit. She just might live and breathe and eat in hunting gear for the rest of her life. They squashed themselves up against a trunk as the helicopter swung directly overhead, waiting in tense silence. As soon as it flew off, they made a mad dash through the foliage and hit another dry creek bed. The ground was muddy, and smelled heavily of decomposing forest detritus. Follow the creek, Dal said. Stay low. It was a good plan. They were able to move more quickly through the stream bed than they could through the forest. Amanda alternated between watching the sky and jumping over the large river rocks that lined the bottom of the bed. The helicopter zipped overhead, once again heading for the clearing. Through the trees, Amanda glimpsed enough of the meadow to see the golden brush flatten. No doubt about it, the Soviets were landing. They know we escaped, Amanda whispered. It would have been obvious when the Russians got to the truck and found no bodies. They're trying to find us. She was so scared, she thought she might vomit. We have to find a place to hide, Dal said. But where? Lena never slowed as they rushed down the creek bed. 
No one answered. They all scanned the area as they moved. Amanda came up empty. Short of crawling up a tree, there was no place that provided solid coverage if the Soviets were on foot. None of the foliage was dense enough. They'd make way too much noise if they tried to make a run for it. The helicopter touched down. Half a dozen Soviets piled out as the chopper blades slowed. The engine clicked off. The Russians obviously planned to sweep the area thoroughly if they were turning off their ride. Amanda hadn't thought it was possible to be any more frightened. You'd think having grenades practically dropped on your head would be the worst part of your day. Nope, this was definitely worse. Feeling like a deer with a swarm of Soviets hunting your butt was definitely worse. Her eyes landed on a tree that had fallen across the creek bed. The tangle of the crown completely blocked their path. The water, when it had been flowing, had cut a steep embankment around the remains of the trunk. We can hide under here. Come on. Dal dropped to his knees and crawled beneath the trunk. It was a tight fit for Amanda. She dropped onto her elbows and Army crawled her way in not even caring when the river rocks crunched against her stomach and hips. A hollow had formed beneath the log from the current. There was just enough room for the three of them. Damp mud of the riverbed poked through between the rocks, the fallen trees sheltering the earth from the worst of the summer heat. It wasn't a great hiding place, but it was better than anything else they'd found. On one side, the hiding place was completely blocked by the trunk, but the opening to their hidey hole would be obvious to anyone diverting around the trunk. Amanda's mind raced. She didn't want to bet her life on the off chance a Soviet wouldn't explore the stream bed. There were several large boulders up against the shoulder of the creek. Amanda licked her lips, wondering how much they weighed. She had helped lift that tree trunk off Lena. Could she move one of those boulders? Soviet voices reached her ears. Amanda shifted her body, wedging her sneakers against the side of a boulder. Bracing herself against the rocky ground, she pushed. And pushed. Sweat beaded her temples from the exertion. She didn't let up. Her muscles strained. The boulder slid, pushed free of the mud that had congealed around it. Amanda paused gasping for breath. Dal and Lena watched in shocked silence. She readjusted, pressing her back up against the embankment so she could get better leverage. Scrunching up her knees, she once again wedged her feet against the boulder. She counted down in her head, taking in several gulps of air as she readied her muscles. Three, two, one. Amanda shoved with everything she had. The boulder inched across the stream bed. She didn't let up. Her muscles screamed in protest. Her thighs burned and her stomach shook. Rocks dug painfully into her tailbone. She pushed with everything she had, bunching her hands into fists from the effort. The earth gave way under her pressure. The boulder slid forward, blocking the tree-tangled entrance. They were hidden, completely concealed from the Soviets. Chapter 21 Ants Amanda slumped to the ground, panting for breath. She stared at the rock, exhilaration pounding in her temples. She... Amanda Nielsen had just moved a boulder. That was stuff wrestlers did, not biology nerds. A few tears leaked out of her eyes. Relief mingled with awe. She hadn't felt this good about herself since acing her honors chemistry final last year. No, that wasn't accurate. Getting an A in honors chemistry had been radical, but it was nothing compared to the feat of raw strength she had just exhibited. How much did that boulder weigh? Two hundred pounds? More? 
No wonder all the varsity sports guys were into themselves. Amanda wasn't sure she'd ever felt so into herself as she did at that moment. Someone squeezed her hand. She looked up to see Lena beaming at her. The other girl gave her a wide smile and a big thumbs up. Dal added his own thumbs up, giving Amanda an approving nod. She thought she might burst with pride. As they huddled together in the cracked dirt with nothing but a tangle of branches and a boulder separating them from the Soviets, it occurred to Amanda that if she'd been born a boy, her life would have been different. Her body would have been viewed as an asset. She could have been popular like Leo and Anton and Bruce. She could have played varsity football. This realization rocked her to the core. She would have not been more shocked to see a unicorn trot out of the trees. Her body was a deep, secret shame she carried close to her heart. Not a day passed where she did not yearn to look like the skinny girls in the MTV videos. People like Mrs. Fink just made it all that much worse. If she'd been born with a penis instead of a vagina, she would have been viewed as a worthy specimen. Amanda digested this as she lay in their hiding spot, pondering her genitalia. One little thing, well, one big thing, really, had changed her fate. A stupid chromosome had swept in and played a dirty joke. The world was really fucked up. So what if she had a vagina? She was an Amazon. Dal had said so. If she survived and made it back to the cabin, she was going to start acting like one. No, scratch that. She could move trees. She could move boulders. Amanda was going to start acting like an Amazon right now. An Amazon could survive the Russians who hunted them. Amazons didn't shrivel up like raisins in the sun. They lived to fight another day. That's what she would do survive. There were loose leaves and sticks in their tiny hollow. Lena gathered them up, covering their bodies as best she could. Luckily, they all wore plain jeans and boring button-down work shirts. They practically blended in with the creek bed already, but extra camouflage couldn't hurt. Lena didn't stop there. She scooped up a handful of mud and smeared it all over her face, gesturing for Amanda and Dal to do the same. Soon, all three of them had mud covering the exposed parts of their skin. Somewhere nearby came rustling. Amanda's heart leaped into her throat. She sat very still, barely daring to breathe. She, Lena, and Dal sat shoulder to shoulder, machine guns across a soft bed of leaves that covered their jeans. The fresh mud made her skin itch. God, she was going to get an acne breakout from this. She just knew it. Although acne seemed a pretty small price to pay to avoid having your head shot off by enemy invaders. Something stung her hand. Looking down, she spotted an ant crawling across her skin. Not just one ant, several of them. Wrinkling her nose, she squished them. Another sting flared on her back, then several more across her hip. Horrified, she scanned the ground and realized the ground crawled with ants. Thousands of the little black things tracked across the ground, and they were sitting right in a pile of them. Dal and Lena realized the situation just as Amanda did. She saw them pinching the ones they could reach. They were covered in mud, hiding in a ditch, surrounded by ants and enemy Soviets. Wow, there really was a way for things to get worse. Who would have thought? Amazon, she reminded herself. You're an Amazon. Amazons didn't get weak need over ants. They were bugs for crying out loud. Yes, getting bitten sucked big time, but on the scale of insect encounters, this was pretty mild. It would have been much worse to sit in a cluster of ticks, or, or even worse, 
a black widow nest. This wasn't so bad. Just ants. No big deal. A swarm of bites broke out across her lower back. Amanda didn't react. She was too busy listening to the sound of approaching soldiers. There were two of them. They spoke softly to one another. Lena had her head cocked, listening intently. Amanda would have given just about anything to understand Russian. The soldiers crunched through the bed, moving slowly through the terrain. Amanda saw the tip of a machine gun before she saw the soldier attached to it. The first man came into view. His form was obscured by the tangled branches in front of them, but the red star, sickle and hammer on the breast of his uniform, practically glared at her through the tree limbs. The ants had made their way under her shirt and bit their way up her back. She swallowed, not daring to move. It seemed a small thing to endure in light of the current situation. The two men surveyed the land on either side of the fallen tree. They spoke softly to one another, likely weighing their options on which way to go. To her horror, they came straight toward the embankment where she and her friends hid. She tensed, shifting her finger to the trigger of her machine gun. Dal gave her a warning look as he pulled out his knife. She nodded in understanding. Shooting was a last option. It would bring high hell into the stream bed with them. She did her best to melt into the ground. It was time to become one with the ants. The first of the Soviets slung his machine gun over his shoulder, pulling at the exposed roots that stuck out of the earth. Grit showered down into their hiding place. Amanda blinked rapidly as dust landed on her eyelashes. The man scrambled up the side of the bank. He was so close, Amanda could see the leaves and mud sticking to the soles of his boots. His partner was so busy looking up that he never glanced their direction. The guy started up the side as soon as his comrade finished scrambling up. His foot slipped, breaking through loose earth. His leg dangled right in front of Amanda. Dal's grip tightened on his knife. The muscles along his arm and neck tensed. He was ready to pounce. The soldier flailed, calling to his friend. Sharp laughter answered him. Amanda knew what it sounded like to be ridiculed. The two men exchanged words. The biting from the ants itched to high hell. The loose leg above her continued to kick, trying to find purchase. Amanda had to lean to one side to avoid being booted in the face. After a long, tense minute, the leg rose and disappeared from sight. Amanda and the other sagged with relief. They listened as the soldiers tromped off and jumped back into the riverbed on the other side. Amanda kept her back pressed against the bluff, only her eyes moving as she watched the soldiers. Even after the Russians disappeared from sight, none of them so much as shifted position. They stayed right where they were, afraid the slightest movement would give them away. Chapter 22 Slog The Russians continued to comb the area. Another patrol came near to their hiding place, but nowhere near as close as the first. Amanda was miserable. The stinging of the ants was slow torture. The thin layer of mud had dried and itched like crazy. A banana slug had found its way onto her sneaker. No less than two gnats had flown up her nose. She took heart in the fact that real Amazons probably endured stuff like this on a regular basis. Heck, they were from South American jungles for crying out loud. There were more bugs in a square mile in jungle than in all of California. This was pretty much kitten's play. Or at least, this is what she tried to tell herself as the ants bit their way over her body. They had made their way down her pants and up her shirt sleeves. She was pretty much a giant ant feeder. 
How long would it take the ants to eat her to death? Likely, she would die of dehydration first. This thought was a sober reminder that they had no water whatsoever. At least they were waiting out the heat of the day in this little mud hole. That had to count for something, right? One day, this would be a memory she would share with her grandkids. She would be old with curly gray hair and fuzzy pink slippers. When her grandkids came over, she'd beg chocolate chip cookies and they'd beg to hear the story about the time ants almost ate their grandmother to death while she waited out a Russian death squad. The image of herself in fuzzy pink slippers was jarring. No, she'd have to have something more edgy. No pink slippers. Amanda had no idea what it meant to have edgy slippers, but she would figure it out. She would definitely make chocolate chip cookies. Her mom had the best recipe. Amanda would make sure the recipe lived on in the family, just like her nearly eaten alive story. Both would endure. She would see to it. How long had they been hiding? An hour? Longer? Too bad she'd never been a Girl Scout. Those girls probably all knew how to tell time by the angle of the sun and the length of the shadows. Or was that Boy Scouts? The womp-womp of the chopper blades abruptly filled the air. Amanda was so intent on enduring the ant bites that she jumped and whacked her head on a root that stuck out of the ground just above her. She looked at her friends. They looked as pensive as she felt. None of them dared to move. It wasn't until they heard the helicopter lift into the air and fly away that they finally relaxed. You guys okay? Lena asked. Her voice was raspy from the long period of tense silence. Amanda shuddered. I'm being eaten alive by ants. I think we're sitting on a nest, Dal said. They're in my pants. Me too, Lena and Amanda said in unison. The three of them exchanged relieved, wry grins. Dal was the first to move. There wasn't enough room to stand. He rolled forward onto his knees and unzipped his fly. Sorry, Amanda, he said. They're in my crotch. Lena, babe, can you help me? The whole thing would have been laughable if Amanda hadn't felt the first bite of an ant in her own crotch. She turned her back on the pair and busied herself with her own army of ants. There wasn't enough room in their little hideout. She and Lena were bumping butts, and Amanda was pretty sure she had half a dozen ants in her armpits. Guys, we have to get out of here. Can you move the rock? Lena asked. Yeah. Amanda braced her back against the bluff, placed her feet on the boulder, and pushed. It was easier to move now that it wasn't half stuck in the mud. You might be one of the strongest people I've ever met, Dal said. They dispersed into the open. Amanda turned her back on the couple and pried herself out of her shirt and jeans, using her shirt to slap at her skin. She jumped up and down and shook out her limbs, trying to dislodge all the bugs. She was horrified to find a line of them snaking across her stomach. Her skin was covered with dozens and dozens of tiny red bumps, the ant bites. The situation was so awful that she didn't even care that she was flapping around in a ditch in nothing but her bra and underwear. She glimpsed Dal and Lena in the same state in her periphery, but she was too distracted with the ants crawling all over her to pay any attention. There were a few minutes there when I began to think it would be better to get bitten by a zombie, Lena said. Dal was smacking her body with his shirt, doing his best to get the ants off. It took them nearly thirty minutes to rid themselves of the ants. By the time they finished, Amanda was exhausted. She sagged onto a boulder, not caring that she was still in her underwear. She wanted to be sure all the ants were gone before she put her clothes back on. 
Besides, she suspected there might still be ants in her pants. She was thirsty, tired, scared, and in her underwear with no way home. She picked chunks of mud off her face and neck, flicking them to the ground. Amanda, you okay? Her gaze flicked in Dal's direction before she could think better of it. Her mouth sagged open at the sight of him in his boxers. Coughing to cover her shock, she looked away. She was pretty sure no guy was supposed to look that good in his underwear, except for actual underwear models. Would there ever be a guy in her life who'd stand around in his underwear the way Dal stood in front of Lena? Amanda, you okay? Dal asked again. Yeah, I'm okay. Guys, what are we going to do? We have to get back to the cabin, Dal said. But the Russians are still out there. Amanda reflexively looked skyward. Like I said, we have to get back to the cabin. It's the safest place I know of in West County. Amanda resolutely picked up her clothes and gave them a big shake. Dal was right. They had to get home. The longer she sat around staring at her clothes and worrying about ants, the longer it would take to get there. She dressed, pinching the few remaining ants she found. By the time she was dressed, Lena and Dal were back in their clothes. It was much easier to look at Dal when he was dressed. You okay? Lena came over and gave her a quick hug. Amanda squeezed her back, grateful for the other girl's friendship. I'm okay. You? I think I peed a little when that guy's leg broke through just above us. Me too. The girls exchanged quick grins. Amanda wondered what high school would have been like if Lena had hung out with her, Cassie, and Stevenson. Time to move out. Dal squashed an ant on the side of his neck. Keep your eyes peeled for water. They spent the rest of the day slogging their way through the countryside. The land was heavily forested, and after their run-in with the helicopter, they didn't dare head for any of the open grassland they saw in the distance. Amanda put her head down and threw all her focus into the relentless slog. She was sweaty and thirsty. Her mouth felt like it had been swabbed dry with a cotton ball. It was late in the afternoon when they chanced to cross a small spring-fed pool no more than a foot across. Six hours ago, Amanda would have debated the pros and cons of drinking water from an open spring. She'd written her junior biology paper on waterborne bacteria. Amanda could recite the scientific names of more than a dozen different ones, as well as the various diseases they inflicted on those unfortunate enough to consume them. She fell to her knees and practically shoved her entire face into the cool spring. She scooped up great handfuls of water and sucked it down. Simultaneously, she scrubbed at her face, trying to clean off the sticky bits of dried mud. Once she had her face clean, she bathed her neck, hands, and wrists. Dal and Lena did the same. The three of them huddled around the small pool of water. When they finished, they sat back on their heels, staring at one another. We're going to have to find a place to sleep. Lena shaded her eyes, looking at the sun. We aren't going to make it home tonight. You'd think after a day like today, the idea of sleeping outside wouldn't have fazed her. Not so. Amanda found the idea of sleeping outside, exposed and in the dirt, alarming. How far are we from Pole Mountain? she asked. Hard to say for sure, Lena replied. I'd say we've come, what, uh, five miles? Six? What do you think, Dal? Five or six miles? Amanda blinked, momentarily taken aback. Had she really gone that far? She stared down at her filthy, mud-streaked body. It wasn't a pretty sight, but damn, she was impressed. Who would have thought she'd be able to go so far on foot? 
Up until today, the farthest she'd ever gone was a mile, and that was only because Mrs. Fink had made her. She never dreamed she had so many miles in her body. I'd say six miles or so, Dal said. We should try to get another few under our belts before the sun goes down. Shouldn't we just keep going? Amanda liked the idea of hiking in the dark a lot more than she liked the idea of sleeping on the ground. Dal frowned in thought. We could try, but it will be hard to see under the trees. We risk rolling an ankle or tripping. Let's get as far as we can before the sun goes down. Then we stop for the night. Lena looked down at the small spring. What I wouldn't give for a few water bottles. Drink up, Dal said. This might be our last chance. This late in the season, there won't be a lot of water out there. We got lucky with this one. They spent another few minutes at the spring. Amanda drank water until her belly ached with it. I really hope none of us get sick. The other two looked at her. Since there was nothing anyone could do about it, they kept drinking. When they set out again, Amanda's stomach sloshed with water. She took comfort from that. It wouldn't last forever, but she wouldn't be keeling over from hydration any time soon. They hiked until dusk, daring to travel through a wide expanse of grassland only when the sky dimmed to a murky gray. By the time they reached the trees on the other side, stars were coming out. It was thick as pitch beneath the trees. Dal had been right. There was no way to keep hiking safely in the dark. Have you ever been camping before? Lena asked her. Amanda's one and only experience of being stuck outside was the time her mom lost the house keys at the grocery store. They'd been forced to call a locksmith which her mom insisted was cheaper than breaking a window. Amanda had been stuck outside with her mom for nearly two hours while they waited for the guy to come. Before the invasion, that had been on Amanda's top ten list of crappy days. She'd accidentally stepped in a big puddle in the grocery parking lot and been forced to sit, shivering, in the car the whole time. Her mom hadn't wanted to waste gas and had refused to turn on the engine to warm her up. The scenario was laughable now, especially compared to the prospect of sleeping outside without a tent or a sleeping bag. God, their lives had been so cush. She'd taken it all for granted. No, I've never been camping before. We weren't really a camping family. She was acutely aware of the fact that Dal and Lena were most definitely outdoorsy types, as evidenced by their hunting cabin and their high level of comfort with hunting weapons. It's better when you have a tent, Dal said, but it will be okay. It's just for one night. Okay. Amanda was determined not to be a wuss. She was an Amazon. She had lifted a big-ass tree off Lena. Sleeping outside would be a cakewalk compared to that, right? Wrong. Dell found a small clearing beneath some oak trees. Amanda knew she was in for a hard night when she blundered right into a spider web. Sticky bits of it stuck to her hands and face as she tried to pull it away. Dell and Lena at least had each other for warmth. They curled up together on the ground, spooning. Amanda felt exposed and alone under the tree. She tried not to think about all the bugs that might be buzzing around in the night air. It was impossible not to think about all the creepy, crawly things on the ground. If she never saw another ant again, it would be too soon. The forest floor was cold, lumpy, and wet. Sticks poked her. As she struggled to find a comfortable position, she realized she was exhausted and hungry. How far do you think we went today? she asked. I'd say seven miles at least, maybe eight, Dal replied. We'll make it back to the cabin tomorrow. 
I'm glad you know the way. If I was out here by myself, I'd never make it back. I'd probably spend days walking in circles. She heard that happen to people when they were lost in the woods. They literally walked in circles. Dal chuckled softly. <laughs> I grew up out here hunting with Leo and Mr. Chikino. You develop a good sense of direction when you spend a lot of time outside. Well, that explained why she had no idea where she was. She didn't hunt or spend time outside. As the night deepened, Amanda got colder and colder. The ground got more uncomfortable with every passing second. She looked enviously at Dal and Lena, cocooned together. They dozed in each other's arms. The perfect couple. She wished Stevenson or Cassie was with her. Then she'd have someone to spoon with. In that moment, she desperately missed her two best friends. What were they doing right now? Stevenson and Nona were no doubt worried sick about them. Were they waiting up for them? If it was up to Nona, she'd probably have Stevenson working in the kitchen until late at night. She did that even when everyone was home. Cassie and Leo would probably be at the bridge by now. Amanda imagined the two of them exchanging a kiss before heading off to plant bombs on the Luma Bridge. The thought made her sigh wistfully. Would she ever have a boyfriend? It seemed impossible. Then again, less than 24 hours ago, she hadn't even been aware of her own strength. If she could move boulders... Who was to say she couldn't get a boyfriend? It was this thought that finally sent her into a restless sleep. Chapter 23 Possibility Amanda awoke to the sound of engines. Alarm had her bolting upright, heart pounding in her chest. She was cold. She half expected to find her body covered with frost except West County never had frost this time of year. Dal and Lena were already awake. Dal was up in a tree, scouting the land around them. Amanda studied the sound. It wasn't the helicopter. It wasn't loud enough to be the helicopter. But it wasn't a car either. The engine, engines, weren't loud enough to be cars. What the heck was it? Dal jumped down after a few minutes, an expression of alarm pinching his face. They sent in another team to search for us. They're on ATVs. Four of them, two Soviets on each ATV. One's coming our way. We have to get out of here. Amanda tried to remember what it felt like not to be scared shitless. It seemed impossible. They hustled away from their sleeping place. At least they left behind no trace. It wasn't like they had a fire or anything else to disturb the forest. It was the first time Amanda was thankful they didn't have any gear when they went to sleep last night. Dal led them at a quick lope through the woods. This part of the forest wasn't as overgrown as other parts. Unfortunately, that also meant there was less cover. The buzz of the ATVs was like a drill on the back of her skull. She focused on keeping up with Dal and Lena, once again thanking Jane Fonda for her crazy workouts. When she'd first awakened, her face, arms, and feet felt frozen. It wasn't long before her body warmed up. Soon, she was sweating freely. She dimly noticed leaves and twigs still clinging to her clothes. Good. Maybe that would provide extra camouflage. The hum of the ATVs were all around, like a swarm of buzzing flies. It was clear to Amanda they had split up to comb the forest for them. Man, the Soviets must be desperate to get their hands on the snipers. She did not want to think about what would happen if they got captured. Leo and Jennifer had seen a KGB agent at the Craigs. Amanda had seen enough movies to know what that meant. If the KGB was in America, 
it would no doubt spell torture for anyone they captured. We have to hide. Everyone up. Dal stopped beneath a tangle of bay trees. In the middle of the cluster was a tree that had been felled in a lightning storm. The bark of the fallen tree was black, worn smooth after exposure to the elements for a few years. It was lodged firmly between three of the living trees, giving them access to the upper portion of the boughs. Lena went up first, leading the way. At Dal's gesture, Amanda followed her. She leaned forward, gripping the burned bark with both hands. Digging the toes of her sneaker into the wood, she scrambled up the trunk. Amanda had never tried to climb a tree before. It was easier than it looked. She shimmied easily up the side, climbing into the concealment of the pungent bay leaves. Lena scrambled out onto a limb and found a perch. Amanda went past her, searching for a place to secure herself. Just ahead was a V where the side of the fallen tree rested. It was surrounded by dangling bay tree branches. Amanda pushed through the leaves and found a seat in the V. She chanced to peek down at the ground, which was a solid thirty feet beneath her. With a start, she realized she wasn't scared of heights. That was a surprise. She had always avoided heights because she'd assumed they'd be scary. As Dal scrambled past her into a higher part of the tree, Amanda realized she'd spent her entire life making assumptions about herself that weren't true. She'd assumed she wasn't strong simply because she was a girl, and in her mind, girls weren't strong. That was clearly not true. Because of her body, she'd assumed she wasn't athletic. Another thing that wasn't true. Here she was, bushwhacking through the wilderness of West County with Dal and Lena. Not once had she had trouble keeping up with them. And now she was perched in a tree like a bird. And it wasn't scary at all. Amanda made a silent promise to herself to stop living her life based on assumptions. She would start living her life based on possibilities. As she listened to the whine of the circling ATVs, she became aware of her rumbling stomach. It felt like it had been carved out with a spoon. A bay leaf tickled her cheek. As she brushed it aside, she paused. She was in a bay tree. Her mother cooked with bay leaves. Granted, she only used them to season soups and stews. She always fished them out whenever the meal finished simmering. But just because Amanda had never eaten a whole bay leaf didn't mean it wasn't possible. Maybe they were sitting on their breakfast. Literally. There had to be a reason her mom didn't leave them in the food. A memory tickled the back of her mind. Something about bay leaves being tough, even after stewing for hours on end. Maybe that was why they were plucked from food after their seasoning work was done. They were tough and hard to eat. But that didn't mean they couldn't be eaten. Possibilities. She had just promised herself she was going to live a life based on possibility, not unfounded assumptions. She pulled off two bay leaves and shoved them into her mouth. The strong flavor almost made her gag. She paused, swallowed, and resumed chewing. After a few seconds, the strong flavor didn't bother her nearly as much. The chewing even brought out saliva, which helped strip away the unpleasant feeling of cotton mouth. There's an ATV coming in our direction, Dal hissed down from his perch. He'd crawled nearly to the top of the tree. Don't move. Amanda stopped chewing. Her scalp prickled with fear. She rested her hands on her machine gun. It would be tempting to shoot the Soviets, but that would just draw the rest. She didn't have great visibility in her position, but she did have a clear view of the ground. When the ATV passed beneath them, 
she held her breath, praying they wouldn't notice their tree. The ATV rolled out of sight, never slowing. She listened to the engine fade away into the distance. Dal crawled down the trunk, stopping when he reached Amanda and Lena. I had a good view from up there. We have another few miles of forest before we reach pasture land. Unless we go miles out of our way, we won't have cover once we get to the pasture land. We don't have the supplies needed to go miles out of our way, Lena said. Agreed, Dal said. But we're not going to make it through the pasture land if we don't figure out how to deal with the Soviets. We'll be sitting ducks. His words made Amanda want to curl in a ball and hide in a hole. We have to do something, Lena said. Think we could hunt down one ATV, kill the soldiers, and take their ATV? I thought about that, Dal shook his head. But the others would be able to follow the sound of our engine. We could inadvertently lead them straight to the cabin. We have to come up with something else. Amanda forced herself to think. Possibilities. She'd promised herself she was going to start seeing the world through the lens of possibility. She might not be as good at chess as Cassie, but she still had a sharp mind for strategy. They had a few advantages. For one thing, Dal was a damn good shot. So was Lena. Snipers was an appropriate moniker for their group. They also had eyes on the Soviets while the Soviets were still searching for them. The Soviets had numbers on them. They also had the ATVs, which gave them speed and agility Amanda's group didn't have. Their advantage no doubt made them cocky as hell, which could also be used to their advantage. A solution leaped into sharp focus in her mind. We have to eliminate the Russians before we get to the pasture land, Amanda said. We could set a trap and lure them to us with gunfire. As soon as they're within range, you guys can sniper them from a distance. Once we, uh, you guys I mean, eliminate them, we can steal their ATVs and go home. That might be doable, Lena said if we find the right place to ambush them. We need the high ground, Dal said. Somewhere they can't reach us on their ATVs. This tree won't work. There isn't enough visibility. I saw a bluff southwest of here. It's two miles out. If we can get there, it would give us the high ground. Two miles. Knowing they had to cross unfamiliar terrain infested with Soviets made two miles feel like two thousand. Still, what choice did they have? Amanda grabbed a handful of bay leaves and passed them to Dal and Lena. What are these for? Dal crinkled his brow at her in amusement. Food, Amanda replied. The leaves are tough and... They don't taste good, but we need whatever nourishment we can get. Good idea, Amanda. I don't know why I didn't think of that. Lena nodded in appreciation at the leaves in her hand. Nona would never let me live that down. We won't tell her. Dal winked at Lena. Shoving a few leaves into his mouth, he led the way back to the ground. Chapter 24 Trap They spent the next few hours creeping through the forest and dodging ATVs. The Russians were dogged in their pursuit. It seemed to Amanda they spent more time hiding than moving. It was late morning by the time they reached the bluff Dal had seen from a distance. The three of them stood looking up at a steep hillside covered with oak trees. It rose fifty yards into the air and overlooked the forest behind them. Amanda estimated the grade to be thirty or forty percent. To Amanda, it looked like they'd need a rope and grappling hook to climb the bluff. But Dal and Lena tackled the hillside with their bare hands, leaning forward to grab rocks and roots as they scrambled up. Amanda firmly reminded herself 
She was an Amazon. Following her friends, she grabbed onto a tree root and began to climb. She was panting within minutes, but kept up with Dal and Lena. Her foot slipped once on loose leaves, but she caught herself on a rock. In the distance came the constant hum of the ATVs. The higher they climbed, the louder they sounded. She decided it was officially the worst sound on the planet, even worse than the growl of zombies. At least zombies would just eat her and get it over with. Zombies wouldn't drag her into a KGB dungeon and torture her. We need to spread out, Dal huffed. Shoot at them from different locations. It will make it harder for them to pinpoint where we are. Amanda eyed the distance between where they stood and the small clearing below them. I'm not a great shot. Even though she'd learned how to handle a gun, she was a long way from being able to sniper things the way Dal and Lena could. Maybe you should be stationed here, lower down on the bluff, Lena suggested. Dal shook his head. I don't want for us to be too far from one another. If we have to make a run for it, we could get separated. Amanda didn't like the idea of not being able to help. There were only three of them against eight Soviets. They were going to need every gun they had and a whole lot of luck to pull this off. Sticking her somewhere in a tree where she had no hope of making a decent shot was not the answer. I'll stay here. She tried to sound decisive, even though a tiny voice inside her head hoped they would try to talk her out of it. We're going to need every advantage to pull this off. I'm no help up there. Are you sure? Lena asked. Yeah. Now that was an outright lie. Amanda wasn't sure at all. Okay. Dal's eyes were pinched on the edges. I don't like us being scattered, but it's the best play we have. Amanda, pick a tree that gives you a good vantage point over that open area below. Okay. When Lena and I are in position, I'll fire into the air, Dal said. That will draw them to us. If we get separated for some reason, head southwest. That will get you home. Amanda didn't bother telling him she had no idea which way was southwest. What was the point? Besides, they were going to pull this off. They were going to lure the Soviets, kill them all, and get their ATVs. There was no need for her to worry about directions. Right? She stuffed down her doubts as Dal and Lena picked their way up the slope and disappeared from sight. Amanda found an old oak tree that had split near the base when it was young. It created a V that made it easy for her to scramble up. From there, it was only a matter of climbing up high enough so she could see the land below. She straddled a wide branch and leaned forward, resting her forearms on a large patch of lichen. Once she was secure, she readied her gun. She had a good view of the clearing below. Even better, she realized there were wide gaps between the trees. There wouldn't be many places for the Soviets to hide when they came for them. In theory, the snipers should be able to pick them off like sitting ducks. She could hardly believe they were actually doing this. Common sense said to avoid enemies, not wave a flag and get their attention. Ten minutes later, Dal discharged his machine gun into the air. The staccato of the gun echoed over the woods. It was as good as setting off a flare gun. As soon as he ceased firing, Amanda detected the ATV's shifting direction. They'd heard the shots. Dal fired one more time, just to help them get a lock on their location. Within minutes, she saw the first of the ATVs zipping through the woods. It headed straight for them. The driver hunched low behind the steering wheel. The soldier mounted behind him had his machine gun ready. He swept his gaze left and right, clearly trying to locate them. Dal sent up another burst of machine gun fire. The gaze of the soldiers whipped in their direction. They shifted trajectory, coming straight 
for the bluff. Just as they did, Amanda spotted the second ATV. It was only a short way behind the first and closing fast. Here goes nothing, Amanda licked dry lips. Resting the tip of her machine gun on a branch, she waited. The first ATV came closer, closer, closer. A shot rang out behind her. The driver's chest bloomed red. A second shot followed the first. The head of the second Soviet exploded. Damn, her friends were good shots. Amanda made a silent promise to keep practicing with her gun when she got back to the cabin. The ATV careened to one side and went straight into a tree. The bodies fell off, blood welling out of the corpses to pool on the ground below. One ATV down, Amanda whispered. The second one drew closer. She spotted the third and fourth ones in the distance. They snaked through the trees en route to their location. At the sound of the gunshots, they sped up. The next set of soldiers both had their weapons up. The driver steered with one hand and pointed his gun straight ahead. The second soldier was busy scanning the area, weapon poised. Sitting ducks, Amanda murmured. Another shot came from the trees above her. Just as that happened, the ATV dipped into a divot. The bullet went wide, grazing the driver on the shoulder instead of hitting him in the chest. Dal and Lena didn't let up. More bullets punched the air. The driver tried to swerve the ATV behind the cover of a tree, but the ground was too uneven for the sharp turn. The ATV tipped onto its side. Both Soviets spilled to the ground. Once they were down, Dal and Lena made short work of them. Another few shots, and both soldiers were dead. The third and fourth ATVs slowed and converged, coming together in a united front. They rolled slowly through the trees, edging forward. From their position, they could see the bodies of their dead comrades. Their element of surprise was gone. The remaining Soviets stayed out of range, careful to keep trees between them and the bluff. Taking them out wasn't going to be easy, especially now that the Soviets were on to them. Amanda's neck and back prickled with nervous sweat. This has to work, she told herself. The Soviets stopped behind a stand of trees. When they emerged a short time later, they were on foot. They dashed from tree to tree, steadily making their way toward the bluff. Dal and Lena tried to take them out, but these Soviets were freakishly fast runners. Amanda was pretty sure they could all qualify for the Olympics. They stayed close to trees and shrubs for cover. One of her friends got in a lucky shot and managed to bring down a Soviet as he attempted to slink down into a creek bed. Three left. The bodies of one of the dead below her twitched. Panic spiked through Amanda. At first, she thought it was reanimating. She fired reflexively at the body as it disappeared from sight. She was on the verge of panic when she realized the Soviets had taken cover behind the ATV that had tipped over. They dragged a dead guy out of sight. As she peered through her crosshairs, the second body was pulled out of sight. A machine gun poked into view, followed by the dark-haired head of a Russian. The Soviet opened fire on the area where they hid, raking bullets across the steep hillside. Amanda fired back, hoping to catch the guy by surprise. No such luck. The machine gun disappeared from view. She heard the Soviets moving, but couldn't see them. A dull knocking sound drifted up to her. It sounded like they were banging rocks together. What were they up to? Licking her lips, Amanda kept her eyes pinned to the crosshairs of her gun. As soon as the communist bastards showed themselves, she'd lay into them. The minutes dragged. Nothing happened. The Soviets remained hidden behind the ATV with the bodies of their dead comrades. Sweat drizzled into her eyes. 
Amanda realized how hot it had become. The sun beat down, and the air was stifling. Still, nothing happened. Had this turned into a game of chicken? Were the Soviets hoping to wait them out? The snipers needed those ATVs. They couldn't outrun the Russians on foot. Their only chance of making it home was to kill the Soviets and take their vehicles. After what seemed like forever, something moved behind the ATV. Amanda fired. Whoever moved quickly disappeared from sight. Don't shoot, said a thickly accented voice below her. Don't shoot. Like that's gonna work, Amanda muttered. We surrender. Don't shoot. To Amanda's shock, a piece of white cloth on the end of a stick went into the air from behind the ATV. We surrender, the Soviet called. What the hell? Were these guys for real? She wished Lena and Dal were within eyesight. She wanted to know what they were thinking. For her part, she didn't trust the Soviets. The stick with its white scrap of cloth continued to wave back and forth. We surrender. Please don't shoot. Come out where we can see you, Dal's voice carried down the slope. Don't shoot. I won't shoot. Come out where I can see you. Amanda tensed as one Soviet revealed himself. He had a thick, dark beard. In his left hand, he gripped the stick. In his right hand, he held his gun. Put down your gun and come into the open, Dal said. Try anything and I'll blow your head off, Amanda muttered. She got the guy in her crosshairs, ready to pull the trigger at the first sign of danger. She would have killed him already if not for Dal. She would follow his lead as long as she could. The Soviet made his way around the ATV. When he was fully exposed, he placed the gun at his feet. He never let go of the flag. Come forward, Dal said. The Soviet stepped forward another dozen steps. There was something odd about him. Amanda couldn't put her finger on it. There was something weird about his eyes, but she was too far away to see details. There were gray splotches on his face that looked like bruises. His beard glimmered in the sunlight as though he had spilled a bunch of liquid on it. There was blood all over his neck. It stained the collar of his uniform. From the way the sun hit it, she could tell it was fresh. No doubt it was blood from one of his dead friends. We surrender, he said again. Why should we believe you? Dal asked. You are snipers, no? The Soviet replied. We give you information. You give us immunity. Amanda tried to wrap her head around what appeared to be happening. Were these guys really defecting? As much as she wanted to see them all dead, their offer gave her pause. Without a doubt, if they had intel to share, it could be valuable to their fight. They could be staring at a pile of gold. Then again, it could all be a ploy to draw them out and capture them. Amanda weighed the odds and came to the conclusion that it was worth the risk. Dal had obviously come to the same conclusion. We accept your surrender, he called down the slope. Have your friends come out and lay down their arms. No. The Soviet shook his head, beard still glittering under the sun. It could be trap. That's the risk you're going to have to take, Dal replied. A twig snapped below her. Amanda jerked around just in time to see a Soviet hit the slope and dash into the trees. The guy was moving fast. Really, really fast. They're coming up the slope, she screamed. Trap!